Hello, um, my name is Paul Gavriluk and I'm a host of the Spiritual Perception program. Uh, and today in the studio with us uh, is Professor Mark McEnroy, who teaches systematic theology at the University of St. Thomas. Welcome to the program. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, today uh, we will be discussing uh, the subject of the spiritual census tradition in the work of the Catholic theologian uh, Hans Urs uh, von Balthasar. Uh, so Mark, uh, if you could tell us uh, what did you find distinctive of Balthasar's approach uh, to the topic? Yeah, well Balthasar is a very creative modern theologian and so what he does with the idea of the spiritual senses as it has been articulated throughout the Christian tradition is he puts his own distinctive stamp on the idea and there are three aspects that are new in Balthazar's thought. The first is that he brings together spiritual perception with its corporeal or bodily counterpart. Mm -hmm. So whereas previous figures in the tradition have held that one can perceive spiritually without perceiving physically, Mm -hmm. Balthazar says that these two actions of perceiving on the physical plane and perceiving mm -hmm. on the spiritual plane actually go together. They're in fact inextricably conjoined with mm -hmm. one another. Could, so, you give, could you give a sense of these figures uh, in the tradition that have held a different, a different position and perhaps for what reasons and why is it that Balthazar's take on this? Is yeah, the important. figure who contrasts mm -hmm. most sharply with Balthazar's mm -hmm. approach is Origen of Alexandria and for him mm -hmm. The spiritual eye opens, as he puts it, only to the extent that the physical eye closes. Mm -hmm. right? So there's an inversely proportional relationship between the development of spiritual perception and the shutting down of physical perception. Mm -hmm. For someone like Balthazar, though, he wants to say these two acts occur together in the very midst of the physical world one actually perceives spiritually as well. And he does this out of a commitment to what he sees as overcoming the legacy of Platonism in the Christian tradition. And so he's very worried about ideas of the Christian life or ideas of perception in particular that flee the world, that go beyond the physical in the name of a supposedly superior spiritual realm. And so, so the underlying assumption here is also that uh, the spiritual sense is closely parallel uh, the work of the physical senses, or in some sense they are analogous to the work of the physical senses, or not. That's or right, I, that's right, that's right. So just as one perceives mm -hmm. the presence of various objects mm -hmm. with this, the physical senses, the spiritual mm -hmm. senses perceive the presence of something that is not material. Mm -hmm. As I'll talk about more in a moment, mm -hmm. that, that thing is tied to the material but springs out of it in a mm. certain sense. Interesting. So, so, right, so you mentioned, you mentioned three distinctive features. What is, what is the second one? The second one is that Balthazar wants to say that the spiritual senses are not for a kind of mystical elite, right? Mm -hmm. It's not mm -hmm. for those uh, who have, after much striving, mm -hmm. developed spiritual perception mm -hmm. at the end, so to speak, of a long uh, process of mm -hmm. cultivating them. Instead, Balthazar, in one sense, democratizes the spiritual senses. He places them at the very foundations of the Christian faith rather than its apex, if you will. And in so doing, makes spiritual, spiritual senses, spiritual perception available to all Christians. Mm -hmm. So it happens not uh, as after one tries very hard for a very long time. Instead, it can come right at the beginning of the life of faith. What goes along with this is Balthazar's emphasis on grace mm -hmm. in receiving one's spiritual perception. Many figures mm -hmm. in the tradition, of course, will talk about grace ultimately being the way in which one receives spiritual perception. But oftentimes, again, it's at the end of a, of a long process of striving, of uh, ascesis, of self-denial, such that only a few actually attain it. That's not the case for Balthazar. Whereas Balthazar's distinctive emphasis seems to be precisely the operation of grace. That's grace right. That's right. Is, is, yeah. is can, the most significant factor. They, and, and in principle, it's something that's available to all. That's right. That's right. Uh, they can come at any time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, so what about the third? So the third is that Balthazar, mm -hmm. in a way that's more explicit than his predecessors, mm -hmm. talks about the spiritual senses as having an ability to perceive beauty mm -hmm. in particular. Mm -hmm. Previous versions of the doctrine certainly talked about uh, the beauty of Christ, mm -hmm. for example, but they didn't so consistently or so self-consciously develop 
the idea that the spiritual senses are capable of perceiving beauty specifically. And that ties into what Balthazar is doing in his so-called theological aesthetics, mm -hmm. which I'll talk about more. Mm -hmm. So what, what, what is it, I mean, Balthazar is known as a theologian of beauty, uh, and so what is it that is particular, um, and, and, and what role do spiritual senses play in his account of the theology of beauty? That's right. So Balthazar is known for this uh, theological aesthetics, as he puts it, mm -hmm. this way in which he thinks that beauty as a divine attribute needs to be brought back into Christian theology. So he says that if you look to the early church, if you look to the medieval church, you will find figures who talk about this theme. And in the modern period, we've lost sight of the notion that God is beautiful, and additionally, that the creation and the beauty that we find there is an echo of the divine beauty, ultimately. So on, on his scheme, what is it that the spiritual senses perceive? I mean, is there a particular shall we say, dimension mm -hmm. uh, of the beautiful that spiritual sensorium taps into. That's right, that's right. Mm -hmm. So what Balthazar thinks is that everything that's beautiful takes a form, or gestalt mm -hmm. in his mm -hmm. terminology. And in every form there's a material component, so any beautiful object has physical component to it. Mm -hmm. But then in addition to that, there's something more. There's something that is doing the forming, you might say, mm -hmm. something that's pulling together disparate elements and making them one distinct whole. So that aspect of form uh, is immaterial, right? It's not anything that's a particular part. Instead, it's the unifying function, if you will, that draws together objects into one thing. And this is where Balthazar gets very interesting, I think, is he thinks that this immaterial aspect of the form, it's, it's almost a force at certain points, right? That's drawing together these physical things. Um, that immaterial aspect actually displays itself to the human being. Mm -hmm. So in answer to your question, whenever one perceives something that is beautiful, whether it's something in the natural world, whether it's uh, a piece of great art, and whether it's God and God's revelation, this has a material dimension to it, but it also has something more, something mm -hmm. that springs forth, as Balthazar puts it, mm -hmm. sometimes out of the material, shining forth to the human being. Mm -hmm. That thing can't be perceived by the physical senses. It's not a material um, thing or, or force or mm -hmm. um, object. And it instead is picked up by spiritual perception. So as Balthazar puts it, every form has uh, this material component, but it also has a splendor that mm -hmm. shines forth from within the form. So, yeah, and so what's, what's remarkable about this account is that it seems that then the spiritual sensorium plays an indispensable role uh, in this equation. Could you, could, could you say also a few, a few words about the way in which this account could be helpful uh, in contemporary theological accounts of human nature? Uh, and sort of in theological anthropology, but, but specifically what, what, what could uh, contemporary theologians take from, right. from this account? Yeah, so Balthazar thinks that this mm -hmm. actually addresses a major issue within mm -hmm. especially modern Catholic theology. Mm -hmm. And it has to do with issues surrounding why one would think of Christianity as true. Mm -hmm. And we see different options for how this might be explored throughout mm -hmm. the 19th and 20th centuries within Catholic thought. Mm -hmm. One response to that question, why should one think Christianity is true, is to say, as happens at the First Vatican Council and within neo-scholastic ways of thinking, so these are figures in the late 19th and early 20th century, that one thinks Christianity is true because of the authority of those who say it's true. Mm -hmm. So God ultimately, but the church mm -hmm. as well, has claimed for, that these uh, aspects of the faith are true. One then assents to those authorities mm -hmm. in thinking that this is the case. Mm -hmm. So this has uh, a certain dominance yeah. for a number of decades throughout yeah. the late 19th and early 20th century, but some theologians start to grow discontent with this model, right? Because what it does is it says that we should believe on the basis of authority, never having actually experienced mm -hmm. what Christian faith is talking about for ourselves. Mm -hmm. So it's something like thinking that apples mm -hmm. taste good Mm -hmm. without ever having actually tasted an apple. You simply... On the authority of one's parents. That's right. Mm -hmm. Parents, siblings, friends, mm -hmm. whoever, mm -hmm. who say apples taste good, you think, okay, they do indeed taste good, but you haven't actually tasted mm -hmm. of it yourself. Mm -hmm. So this view, extrinsicism, it's called, thinks of 
the truths of revelation, the truths mm -hmm. of the Christian faith as extrinsic or outside of the human being. And they never actually touch, so to speak, human, human mm -hmm. beings, humanity itself. Mm -hmm. So in response to this concern, a number of theologians developed the idea that the Christian faith needs to speak to who we are in our innermost selves. It needs mm -hmm. to resonate with our being, it needs to fulfill us, mm -hmm. not simply be a perhaps unwelcome imposition from outside, mm -hmm. but instead something that meets all of the strivings mm -hmm. that we have experienced in our lives. This takes a number of different forms, but some figures get perhaps a bit carried away with this idea, and they go so far as to say that divine revelation actually is already completely mm -hmm. within us. So immanentism, mm -hmm. this is called. And, and this is, but this is not Balthazar's position. Correct, we correct. should be very clear. We should be clear. Mm -hmm. the, the, these are the two positions the, that mm -hmm. Balthazar sees, mm -hmm. both as having problems. Mm -hmm. So whereas extrinsicism so God touches the, the human mm -hmm. being, the immanentist alternative in saying that revelation mm -hmm. is completely within us already, mm -hmm. Balthazar thinks doesn't give the possibility of God exceeding the human mm -hmm. being. Right? It's an all too yeah. easy way in which yeah. we could reduce the transcendent, glorious, magnificent God mm -hmm. to the human level if it's already mm -hmm. within us. Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. So each has advantages, each has disadvantages. Balthazar thinks that his aesthetic approach to the Christian tradition and the spiritual senses in particular resolves this issue. And the reason he thinks that is because God's revelation mm -hmm. is akin to a great work of art for him. Mm -hmm. And as is the case with great art, when we're exposed to it, it connects with us, right? We're moved by that great art. We get something that we did not anticipate, something that in some cases utterly surprises us, it takes our breath away. That phenomenon says that great art is not wholly within us, it's not completely within us. Instead, it must be to some extent outside of us. And yet, because it connects with us in the first place, it also manages to work its way in, if you will. Mm -hmm. It is a fulfillment of our strivings, but one that's not reducible simply to what we want. Instead, it gives us much more than we could possibly expect or imagine. What an extraordinarily rich uh, and complex uh, and interesting picture that, again, that takes into account human striving desire and also the ability of the mystery of God to sort of draw draw us in. Uh, thank you, Mark, for this uh, very insightful account uh, of Balthazar's treatment uh, of, of, of our topic, and thank you for being with us today. Thank you, Paul. Mm -hmm. uh, if you would like to learn more uh, about the topic, please read Professor McEnroy's book, uh, Balthazar on the Spiritual Senses with Oxford University Press. Thank you for watching our program. I hope to see you for our next episodes. Goodbye.